Hey guys, welcome to uh, Urban Plumbers channel. I'm Adam uh, over from Heat Geek uh, YouTube channel. Today, Simon has taken me over to a, a little B&B over in Rye. It's a carbon neutral B&B with one heat pump. So uh, if you think uh, homes can't be run by a heat pump, how on earth is a B&B with one heat pump gonna produce enough hot water for all those bedrooms and heat the property? Will it work? I don't know, let's find out. But do you see heat pumps as the de facto that are gonna come in and replace all gas boilers and then maybe even have more insulation than gas boilers? Or do you think that they're just gonna fit in a small section of the market? No, or? I think they'll, they're gonna go. I think the heat pump will go national and global as well. I can see this change happening right now. I don't know if it's rumors, if it's true, the sales of boilers dropping by some really large numbers. People talk about 20 to 40% year on year last year. There was other stuff, it wasn't heat pumps only doing it because heat pumps I think slowed down a bit as well. Yes. But it might be people not wanting to change the boilers who can't yet afford a heat pump, mm. keeping their boilers ticking over for a bit longer. Yeah. It might be people getting scared with prices of boilers going up with this clean yes. market mechanism fiasco. Uh, from my world, everyone wants a heat pump, but you know, I'm in my tiny little corner, that's what, that's what I see. It's like getting into an electric car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. There is lack of awareness once you get into one. Mm. You don't want to go back to diesel or petrol, do you? Exactly, exactly. And once you experience your house at 20 or whatever your comfort temperature is at all times, mm. not on off, it's, it's the future, right? Yeah. Let's go. Oh, look at these uh, two mixer jeeds. Javid. Adam, welcome to Magnolia House Thank in you. Rye. Magnolia House in Rye. Uh, this is Javid, the owner of Magnolia House in Rye. Which I'm hoping you'll be able to tell me is the only carbon zero B&B in the county, which I think it is. So um, who installed this? Like, How did you find them? And how did you piece this thing together? Um, in terms of piecing it together, I uh, got most of my information from YouTube, specifically from Heat Geek and uh, Urban Plumbers. That got me onto the whole idea in the first place. Um, then pandemic hit, so there was absolutely nobody available to do the work. So it was literally picking up the phone, phoning up engineers and hoping someone mm. would say yes. Mm. Eventually someone did. They installed it. They installed it properly. I was very happy with the installation. Then they left mm. and I paid them. And then I was then left to figure out how to actually use the thing. And that has been a real challenge. It's been such a bonus having resources like yourself out there because it's from watching those videos from mm. time to time mm. that I went back to my little control panel and started tweaking it. I treated this whole system like a gas-fired boiler on installation. So I was running it short, I was running it at high temperature, I was wondering why I wasn't getting the results I wanted. And when I started getting the knowledge, it seemed totally counterintuitive to me mm. to say, I want my building at 20 degrees and I'm gonna do it at 40 degree water. Mm, mm. But it now finally mm. all works, mm. is dancing, there's a bit further to go. And this really highlights uh, the challenges we face. Mm -hmm. The equipment is out there. Mm -hmm. The knowledge isn't. It's not the machine, it's how it's installed and how it's commissioned. And um, yep. you, you, the installation is pretty good, but um, there's definitely some stuff we can uh, go through here to improve your, your install. So um, can I uh, point out some uh, things that I'd improve? Do your worst. So this is a, a 12 kilowatt heat pump. That's a 12 kilowatt heat pump on single phase. Uh, when I had two separate heating engineers turn up to specify a quote, they were recommending I have two of those units yeah. installed, Very typical. Um, which intuitively felt wrong and I couldn't afford it anyway. So I just bought one. Mm. This property, how many meters squared? Three, 300 it's meters approximately square? 300 square meters. So um, uh, if you allowed, you've got, so this property has uh, internal uh, insulation, wall, uh, wall in, uh, insulation. Um, so I would probably allow about 30 watts per square meter here, which uh, has a load of probably nine kilowatts. So that's probably about right. 24 kilowatts would be way overkill. Mm -hmm. And typically what heating engineers would 
uh, size this property at, mm -hmm. coming from a boiler background of quick heat up, yep. for a short amount of time, then turn it off, yep. because it doesn't quite get the same efficiency uh, as low and slow does from heat pumps. So, so it's sized very well, actually. Well, we have a lot of uninsulated pipe work, don't we? Um, yeah, that's not great, is it? No, joints and corners, that's the first thing you come to, because that's just going to let the heat escape. Uh, so, What are those pipes? Um, I thought they were secondary return, but now I'm thinking they are sensor pockets. Sensor pockets well, are someone, yeah, someone put. Yeah. Right, so this is kind of an unusual setup because we've got a lot of two port zone valves, right? That's controls for every single room because the yeah. property is on thermal skirts, so heated skirting boards, which is really interesting because I, I always assumed they don't have mm. enough surface mm. area, mm. especially for low temperature heating. Yeah. But this property is so well insulated that they seem to be just doing the job, right? Exactly. You mentioned about convection from those. Yeah, so um, the advantage of radiators are that they have convection, as in they allow air to move around them and strip the heat out, as well as radiation. Uh, the thermoskirt only has radiation. Um, so, so it lowers the output, right? Yeah, it's not, it's not great. But uh, when you have as much insulation as this building, uh, it matters much less. We can still get down to uh, 40 degrees flow temperature, which means the efficiency is way up there anyway. I see something we really don't like, which is tons of third-party controls on this setup. Yeah. And also hive. There's loads of hives here. I've got a video about this. Uh, why not to vote zone heating systems? It's all about having as much surface area available to emit the heat from the heat pump as possible. If we start re re uh, restricting the amount of surface area that allows the heat away from the heat pump, the heat pump has to work a little bit harder to push that heat into the building. That's when the efficiency goes down. So ideally we want all zones open. What advantage we do have here is to enable us to do that, we can set all the controls to open all the time and we've got a lot of balancing valves down the bottom here. So if there are imbalances between the heat and the property, we can just adjust these until the property kind of heats evenly and then slowly but surely bring down the controls for any extra trimming from solar gain, etc. And another thing to point out here is that having all those controls has a potential to have just one room, two rooms open. Mm -hmm. So there is not a lot of uh, power that can be moved to the building from the heat pump. However, your system is not throwing errors because you do have a low-loss header. Yeah. Not a buffer, but a small low-loss header. Another thing I've noticed is that you've got a very relatively small circulator for your heating, 1550 or I think 1560. Circulating water at, I think it's six meter head pump, is it? Five yeah, or six? It's five or six. Uh, and it circulates the water around the heating. However, your pump on the actual heat pump is massive. It doesn't have to be. You could probably, you, you, you're probably better off swapping them or removing yes. one of them. And, and it, the system would perform better. But if you remove the header, if you remove one of those pumps, mm. you wouldn't be able to zone the system as much. Right. You could get low flow issue error or, or uh, compressor blocked errors if you did that. So that header is probably serving a function because in a bed and breakfast, you want a individual controls for the rooms. Yeah. Uh, what else do we see here? Well, I, I think like the, the overall summary there is we want less complication and more simplification. So yeah, if we can just directly pump everything around the system, that'd be much better. But also, with all that control comes all this wiring. Yeah, um, it's I, very complex right now. You know, it looks more complicated than it is in reality. And when uh, uh, engineers come here in the future, really you want to have your installation as neat as possible because you will get them taking care of the system better. Um, another thing I've noticed is secondary return, so that it circulates That's the hot water to each room. This pump uh, here. Yeah, that pumps your hot water out of the uh, top of the tank, near to the outlets, and then back. So when you turn on the tap, it gets there quicker. They're good, uh, helpful for comfort. The problem is it wastes heat. So when, as the wa uh, water passes through that pipework, it acts, uh, the pipework acts as a radiator, essentially. So um, as soon as it's done a full revolution, Ideally, you need to have a pipe stat on the pipe to turn off that pump. Otherwise, it's just constantly emitting like a radiator. Or in the best case scenario, you have a pipe stat all the way out at your far end. So once it's reached the far end, it turns off. Um, there are some extra um, regulations you have to get around because you're in commercial. Uh, ideally, you should be getting your return up to 50 deg uh, 55 degrees um, before cutting off uh, in an air Legionella cycle. You can set Legionella cycles in controls like this anyway, yep. once a week. Um, so that would be part of your Legionella cycle, um, which you could override that stat. Uh, and then for the rest of the time, I would ignore that and I would just get it to the furthest point and cut off the pump immediately because you don't need to keep on circulating and leaking heat in the, uh, in the house. 
It'll also cause your extremely well building to get too hot too easily and too quickly in the summer, as you've experienced. So um, I, there's a lot of work to, um, I'll say a lot of work, very easy things. There's a lot you can do about it um, uh, on the hot water circulation part. Hot water pipe work, is that plastic or copper to the taps? Plastic. Right, secondary return isn't ideal for plastic, uh, mm. or even copper for that fact. It's best on MLC pipe work. Um, uh, it causes what they call pasteuri uh, pasteurization, mm -hmm. which is um, that plastic pipe work will be rated to go up to a certain temperature, but mm -hmm. then cool back down to re-solidify. If it's not given that opportunity to cool back down, uh, it basically goes brittle and soft and pinhole leaks. So uh, that's another reason that we might want a uh, thermostatic sensor on here, it's just a pipe clip's 20 pounds, something like that, mm -hmm. to turn off the pump once a full revolution's been complete. And also another reason to keep these tanks as cool as possible if heating from the heat pump. Obviously you want them hotter if you're gonna heat from the solar PV because it's mm -hmm. free, but it's another reason not to keep on circulating the pump because high temperature in combination with um, uh, long run times or long flow times will wear down that pipe over time. Right, one of your main things that you can do to increase efficiency for heating mm -hmm. uh, um, is adjust this flow temperature. This flow temperature is set for a permanent 40 degrees. Every time the heat pump comes on for heating, it will try and target 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. You will need that at minus two, minus three outside or below zero outside. For the rest of the year, that's too much energy. You wanna keep that heat pump running as often as possible. Mm -hmm. So we set weather compensation, which means it will produce 40 degrees at, um, below zero. And for the rest of the year, it produces an ever declining flow temperature, which means your heat pump right. overall scop will yep. skyrocket. And this is one of the rooms in this uh, B&B. What's interesting is they are heated with heated skirting boards. And they, they seem to look like regular skirting boards. I'm kind of amazed they are able to keep the rooms warm in the winter with only, only 40 degree flow, because as I mentioned before, there's no convection on them. They only heat by radiation, and the surface area of that skirting board doesn't seem to be that huge. They are two pipe skirting boards, those ones here. Please. Ah, thank you very much. Well, I'm very impressed. Uh, congratulations on RISE, or the county's only uh, carbon neutral B&B. &B. Uh, mm -hmm. Excellent job, and uh, I can't wait to come and stay sometime. You're welcome back any time. Thank you. Nice thank to you. Meet you, Javid. Cheers now. So what do you think about that install? Um, I mean, like the, the whole thing is, for a typical heating engineer or customer-led install, it's actually fine. It's not bad, is it? Most Samsung I've seen had five pumps, not two. Exactly, that's, like, that, that's, where, that's led by the homeowner. The problem is, because no one in our industry has been trained, essentially, because NVQ level two and three is pants, that's actually pretty good for cobbling stuff together. And that, that is the truth and the reality behind our industry. The, the, the qualification that heating engineers should have is NVQ level 2, 3, but no one gets that, they just get gas safe. Yeah, yeah, because that's the quickest route to the industry and yeah. then you can get any other qualifications you need. Yeah, they're just, safe, they're just safety qualifications, like yeah. the, the gas qualification or the G3 or the um, water regs. They're not how do you design a system. That's something you have to spend three years in college going to do. And even then, because you don't use it outside of college, because the people you work for stopped doing it and using it, all of the uh, learning is eroded away from the industry, but, which is exactly why we have Heat Geek. But that's uh, not even mind. that's not even self-employed small guys. That affects all the companies, including big ones. Exactly. It's because there's no one. The information isn't being passed around on site. It's all very well teaching stuff in the classroom, but if it's not being used, then it gets forget forgotten. And then the, the tutors that are in now, they weren't brought up in an environment where it's being used. So um, the whole industry is just worse off. But that's the secret little trick. I'm going to make it about Heat Geek because it really is. That's the secret little trick that Heat Geek's done. It's gone, ah, oh, where are we missing the, the, the information? Um, it's specifically here. This is theory, like pipe sizing, heat loss, etc. This can all be taught online because it's theory. You don't, do, you don't do a heat loss calculation with your hands. You do it on paper or with your head or on a calculator. It's a very easy thing to up, upgrade on. And that little, that little bit of knowledge just turns you into a, a full on engineer. This is why I get passionate about the word engineer. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if it's that easy though. I don't think 
it takes some doing and some experience. The theory alone Fair point. doesn't get you far enough, I would say. No, theory alone, I, I totally agree with that. For me, to be a, a competent heating engineer or heat pump uh, installation engineer, which is a heating engineer, same thing, it's just a different heat source, 95, 90 to 95% of your skill has to be in joining pipe work, using tools, using the right tool in the right um, um, you know, situation, hand-eye coordination, on-site stuff which heating engineers already know, but without that last 5%, which is theory, you can't do, that, you can't do the job at all. Are we not asking too much then from heating engineers? Should we not divide it? You have people who know how to connect pipes well and quickly, and you know guys how to design the system. Not in my opinion. No, I, I think it's, it's a lot of lot to ask for someone to be good at manual labor and also at theory. The the the, um, the difference I think is that the, the level we teach to at and Heat Geek is far higher than you need to know. That was like, oh, look at where we could explore, and it was almost fun to create training up there. To do a quality heat pump installation, you can use lookup tables and basic rules of thumb to do a very good install. I would think that there would be, a business owner should be at heating mastery level perhaps, but if you're not the owner and you're just doing the install, there should be, should be lookup tables and normal practice. You should know that um, uh, up to sort of um, eight to 10 kilowatts, you use 28 mil pipe, then you jump up to 35. It's just normal rules of thumb because you go around doing the same thing for every single job. Nothing changes from job to job really. You try and not use a buffer or a loss header and if you have trouble with flow rate, you introduce one. Or volume. Yeah, but everyone is stuck to, to, you know, creating zones and thinking zoning is efficiency. Uh, that, putting that, buffers without really understanding why they there. It's, it's yeah, yeah. Like this job here, low loss header. What's yeah? It's, yeah, but this is. I think it's more about the unlearning of bad practices like that than it is learning of new. It's actually making things simple. So stop learning how to put, create all these zones and um, uh, all these extra things like buffers and low loss headers. Only introduce those when you go up to, uh, I don't know, 12 kilowatts load, 13 kilowatts load. Start on smaller homes, because you don't need lots of controls and zones with a smaller home. Some, some installers or some engineers will still question you on not zoning large properties. But they're, they're ever dimish, diminishing in their existence, those installers, as they're learning more and more. I mean, efficiency might be higher if you don't zone, but the energy use will be lower if you do zone. On, on large properties, if you don't zone too much, obviously. Depends on the shape of the property, doesn't it? If it's a, if it's a, and how it's insulated. Well, yeah, one, one top on top of, it, of each other, one floor heated up, that's... Yeah, if you've got an L-shaped building, you yeah, might want to heat one wing and not the other. Yeah. So, um, it, it, di different, it's about design and using the right, appropriate tool in the appropriate situation. And um, I think that's what people need to realize, like trying to just put things into, you should do this or shouldn't do that in all homes is not how you, Oh, no, for that's, anything. That, that's how, how everything seems to work in the building industry and construction. It's like they don't want people to think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are rules. That's a rule. You have to follow that rule without thinking why there's a rule, which is exactly. Well, that's why we break the rules all the time. People get a bit annoyed with it. Exactly. Adam and Simon put the worlds to rights. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the whole like about everything and like people that sort of. Um, oh, grab the camera. Grab the camera. Grab the camera. Got it. <laughs> You might I, have I to can hold it. Much. Keep my hand yeah. on. It's fine. Yeah, um, yeah uh, people just um, they, they hark back to regulations and stuff like that because they can't. They just don't want to make the argument, or they don't want to think. They're happy in their little bubble. 